to the Acts of the Apostles, Acts in chapter number 17, the book of the Acts. This morning we were in and have been in the book of Acts in Sunday school now for a couple of months or so, and we'll be there till we uh, go through the entire 28 chapters. If you don't uh, are not a regular Sunday school attender, have never joined us before, we would sure like to have you at 10 o'clock for Sunday school. We have breakfast every Sunday morning from about 9 to 9.45 over in the fellowship hall. And then we have Sunday school for all ages, uh, for 3, 4, and 5-year-olds, 6, 7, 8-year-olds, 9, 10, 11-year-olds, 12 to 18-year-olds, and then also adults. And we teach the Bible and try and help you. So we've been doing that in the book of Acts in our adult class. We were only around chapter number 4 over there, but I saw something here a while back in chapter 17 in my personal time that I'd like to preach to your heart this morning that I believe would be a help and a blessing to you if you let it. Thank you, Brother Jack, for that good song. Wonderful, wonderful song. Thank you, musicians, for the good playing, and we appreciate you singing so good this morning. Acts chapter 17, we'll begin reading in verse number 16. Acts chapter 17 and verse number 16 this morning. If you found your place, say amen. amen. The Bible said, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. Any preacher that's uh, got any sand or salt in him at all, his spirit ought to get stirred up every once in a while when he sees what is going on in the country and in the area of which he lives. His spirit was stirred in him, and this is why, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Watch verse 27 with me. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets, uh, of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed. Among the which was Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. I'm interested at the end of verse number 27, even though we'll be preaching down through the chapter, the end of verse 27 is what I'm interested in. Notice what Paul says to this crowd of heathens. At the end of verse 27, he says this, though he, speaking of God, though he be not far from every one of us. I'd like to preach this morning for a few minutes on this thought, 
He's just a prayer away. He's just a prayer away. Paul is ministering in our text uh, in the hotbed of what I told you in Sunday school. It's the hotbed in that day of arts, what was considered higher learning, and philosophy. I told our Sunday school crowd in the lead up to the message this morning that Athens, Greece is where Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all of the great minds and philosophers that people to this day still hold up as supposedly brilliant philosophers and brilliant individuals. This is where they studied at and this is where they came from. But when Paul looked around at this city, he didn't see brilliant men. He didn't see scholarly efforts. What he saw was a group of people that were wise in their own conceits and they had a lot of knowledge in their head but they had no knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus in their heart. And he was burdened for this crowd because even though they had full minds and they had full bellies and they had been educated and they've got all of this stuff and they were an affluent society and they had much wealth and prosperity instead they were sickly and they were poor spiritually and knew not the God that could save them from eternal damnation. Paul doesn't back up from this crowd. He looks right at this educated crowd and begins daily to dispute with them and daily to preach and reason with them out of the scriptures that there is but one God and one Savior and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ and that he died on a cross and he rose again three days later so that this crowd might know God and have life and life more abundantly and forgiveness of their sins. And as he preaches to them, this crowd, the more they begin to listen and the more things they begin to say and the more that uh, Luke begins to tell us about the town I can't help but see our own society in this place I can't help but see America in the scriptures that we are reading because brother Wayne this is a crowd that almost feels like they're advanced beyond just one God I mean, we, we, we're, we're, we're smarter than that. <laughs> you know, surely there's more than just one way to heaven. You've got your way, and I've got my way, and they've got... We're not narrow-minded bigots. We're open-minded. We're broad-minded. We're, we're accepting of anything and everything. It looks like America, even in verse number 18, it said this. It said their, their philosophers were called the Epicureans, verse 18, and the Stoics, said, verse 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and Stoics encountered him and said, what will this babbler say? You say, I'm not familiar with these terms. Well, if you study who the Epicureans were, they're still around today. Brother Zach, the Epicureans were a group of people that basically just said this, eat, drink, be merry, live, and let live. If it feels good, do it. The Epicureans was a crowd that believed this, that there was no greater, higher spiritual plane there there was no greater plane as being a human to then to get to a place to where you just enjoyed life. Where whatever you wanted, if you thought it felt good, if you thought it looked good, you took it, you did it, and it just didn't matter what anybody else did. Just enjoy yourself. Y'all, we're living in a society like that today where there is no restraints and it doesn't matter if it's right or if it's wrong, if it's moral, if it's immoral, if it's good or if it's evil, if it's light or if it's dark. Why, if you enjoy it and it makes you feel good, we'll just put it under the banner of love and acceptance and you just knock yourself out with it. I mean, come on, can you not see that today? Not, not, not just with the immoral uh, nature, you, you know, uh, of the sodomite crowd, but I mean, who would have ever thought we'd live in a day where most of our country, they would legalize what many people went to jail and prison for for years and years. Brother, we're living in a generation of people that just... That, that, they dope heads and drug addicts and I mean we're living in a generation brother Kevin of people just walk around getting high off blunts and doobies and you can't hardly go nowhere now what it don't smell like a skunk somewhere everybody just, I mean we're just living in a day where, where people just do whatever they want don't make me feel bad about it I'm enjoying my life 
Then there was the other crowd, Brother Travis. They were called the Stoics, and the Stoics were almost on the other side of the Epicureans. That's where we get our word for Stoicism or being a Stoic individual. They believed that the height of living was to get to a place to where nothing got you excited, where, where there, it was just blase, case sera, sera, what will be, will be, and it just doesn't matter. You know, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It just doesn't really matter. Just don't get excited about nothing. Just be real stoic. And, and there's ditches on both sides of the road. On one side, there's the Epicureans that say, man, let's just live it up and let's just party. And then there's the other side over there that says there ain't no joy in anything. There ain't no happiness in anything. And neither side really understand what life's all about. You don't really understand what life and joy is about until you meet Jesus this morning. And then watch them. Watch this. Watch this part too. Come down, if you will, uh, down to verse 21 and look at what it says here, verse 21. It said, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else, watch this, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Is that not our society? I'm just constantly after something new. I, I got to have something new. You almost can't keep people's attention even in church anymore unless you have something new. It, it's got to be a new preacher or a new singer or a new song or a new message or a new international version or a new American Standard version or a new living translation. Or, or It's got to be something new. I'm looking for something. It's got to be a new King James version. We, we're tired of the old ways and the old paths and the old books and the old time preaching. We don't want that. Give us something new. Give us, a, give us, a, give us something. I mean, that's what Americans crave today. When you watch TV and you sit in front of the idiot box, I mean, it's all predicated on you need this new thing. Watch this new show. Get this new car. Invest in this new venture. Get this new article of clothing. Got to get a new dress. Got to get a new suit. Got to get some new shoes. Got to get something new. It's, it's, I got to have it. I got to heaven and it's predicated upon our lust and that's where these people were we're not interested in anything that we've heard before we've tried before we've done before just give us something new let me just take a time out at the beginning of the message and this ain't my message this morning but just let me say this if you're looking for something new this probably ain't where you're gonna find it at but if you're looking for something that's real old you'll like it around here if you're looking for old-fashioned worship and old-fashioned preaching and an old book and some old songs you'll fit in real good we're not trying to come up to date we're not trying to get along in this world we're trying to stand in the way and ask for the old past where is the good way and find rest and walk therein this morning and this is, but this is what's a blessing to me, Brother Skip. This is what's a blessing. Even though I find America and I find our society mirrored all in what Paul is preaching to in Acts, this is what's a blessing to me. He finally looks at this whole crowd of, of people who are seeking pleasure and some who are just absolutely blanked out on life and think there ain't no joy and there ain't no peace. And he looks at this crowd that's Brother Garrett constantly chasing something new in life. And he looks at them and this is what he tells them in verse 27. He said that they should seek the Lord. Lord, they should feel after him and they would find him. And then he said this, though he be not far <laughs> from every one of us. Brother Donald, that blessed my heart because I'm looking at this crowd and this, this is a messed up bunch. No, there ain't no more messed up bunch than this crowd Paul's preaching to. And yet Paul tells them, it don't matter what you've done. It don't matter what you think. It don't matter what you've been involved in. It doesn't matter what you've said. It doesn't matter how wicked your life is. God is not that far away. You walked in here this morning and you think, man, God's a million miles away from me and I've gone so far and I've run so far and I've got down into a pit so deep that even God don't know where I am. You're wrong this morning. He's just a prayer away. He's just a call away. He's just waiting for a pitted heart to look toward heaven and cry unto him and say, God, I repent. Lord, I trust He's just a prayer away this morning. You think God's some God way off on the backside of the universe and don't know what's going on in your life. Paul said that ain't true. He ain't far from all of us. He's real close this morning. 
You come walking in here and you might have walked in by yourself. You might have walked in with somebody. But yet I found this out. You can sit in a crowd of people, Brother David, and feel like you're just as lonely as if you was on a deserted island by yourself. And your family may be distant from you. And your loved ones may be distant from you. And you may not have anyone that you feel like you're close to. But I'm telling you this morning, you can reach out by faith and you can get a hold of a God. He is not that far away away this morning. I want to show you several people real quick. We got people to baptize this morning, so let me hurriedly preach this, but I want to give you, I want to give you the point of the message. He's just a prayer away. Who, who is he just a prayer away for in the text? Well, we find he was just a prayer away for those who were idolatrous. He was just a prayer away for the idolatrous. You read the text with me. When we began reading, it said, Brother David, that Paul's spirit was stirred in him because he saw the whole city was given to idolatry. This is an idolatrous group of people. I began to study Brother Randy about Acts or about Athens in the book of Acts, and this is what they said. They say this, that Brother Culp, that the, the city of Athens in this day, they estimate this. Scholars estimate they had upwards of 30,000 gods that they worshipped. And they estimate in this day when Paul was there that the population of Athens was only a little over 10,000 people. And one man made this statement from these days. This was the statement that was made, Brother Greg. They said this, it was easier to find a little G God in Athens than it was to find a man in Athens. There were thousands upon thousands of gods that they worshipped. Everywhere there was a god and a little temple set up and people selling these idols and you could worship a god of the sun and a god of the moon and a god of the stars and a god of the plants and a god of the animals and you could worship a god of fertility and you could worship a god of your own making and your own choosing and everything became a god. And let me say this this morning. I know what we start thinking in, in a... Um, in a civilized country. And I don't know how anybody can think America is civilized anymore with the animalistic behavior. Any society that murders their own babies and thinks it's all right, we ain't nothing civilized about us. We just as heathenistic as any country that ever lived. You think you're not a heathen because you ain't got a bone in your nose and because you've got Wi-Fi and because, well, <laughs> bone in your nose. Look, if you've been to Walmart lately, there's even some of them walking around, praise God. You think you're not a heathen because you know how to work an iPhone and an iPad and because you don't walk around and say ooga booga, ooga booga and because you can speak a language and because you've been to school and you've been educated, you think you're not a heathen. But according to the scriptures, that's not what a heathen is. A heathen is someone who lives their life without God. God with no thought or no desire for what might come or what might go because of their actions this morning. And so we read this story, and as we're reading this story, Brother Glenn, we think to ourselves, well, that's just stupid. I mean, you know, 30,000 gods and just, you know, 10,000 people and worshiping all these gods that they've made. No, that's just ignorant. Y'all, it ain't no more ignorant than we are in America. Listen, listen, listen to me this morning. You might have walked in here and be an idolater yourself. You say, how dare you? I'm not an idolater. Oh, yeah, Americans worship all kind of gods. Americans Americans worship money this morning. Oh, it's their God. They've got to have it, and they crave it, and they'll forsake family, and they'll forsake God, and they'll forsake church, and they'll forsake everything to chase one more dollar bill. Why, one of the richest men that ever lived, Sam Walton, they said one of Sam Walton's last requests was, they asked him, would you like anything, Sam? He said, well, I'd like to make one more dollar. Billionaire, got all this money, want to make one more dollar, Brother Rodney. What good would it do you where you're headed to, Sam? Money has become a god in this country. I mean, you say, I don't believe it's a god. You don't? Just watch the news for about 20 minutes and see if one of the main topics ain't money this and money that and the economy this and the economy that. And I'm not against trying to be smart about money. The Bible's got stuff to say about that. But when that's your sole desire and your sole goal, there's something wrong with that. We live in a society that we, we, we have not just made money a god. We've made entertainment a god. If you don't think entertainment's not a God, then look how much money is pumped into Hollywood.
God on a yearly basis. Look how many billions. I didn't say millions. I said billion with a B. Look how many billions of dollars is poured into a group of degenerates that live on the left coast that cuss and live like the devil and cuss to our children and get naked on TV in front of our children. And yet we pay money and millions of dollars a year so that they can do it. It's a God. Come on now, am I cutting too close to home yet? Hey, hey, look at here. I, I, let's do it. We made God out of sports. And I'm all, y'all know I'm bulldog through and through, and I like it. But I don't never go to one of them games. I don't never go to one of them games, Brother Parks, that I don't look around and think, man, this is a God to people. Because the same crowd that would look at me and laugh and mock and point and joke and say I'm a backwards inbred redneck and ain't got sense enough to get out of the rain and shout and cry and weep about a Savior that saved me, they are the same crowd that come this fall, they will take their shirt off, paint something on their chest and stand out in frigid conditions and scream and holler for their favorite football team. They will pack out 100,000 strong in NFL. MLB, NCAA stadiums. It has become a God to us. Sex is a God in America. Don't quit you up on me. You heard ten times worse than that this morning before you ever come to church. If you don't think that sex isn't a God to America, you haven't seen the advertisements on every nearby advertisement for selling anything. Selling anything. They could sell footwear and somehow slip in something sensual. They could sell, brother, they can sell anything, a car, a golf club, and try and put something. You say, what is that? It's a God to Americans. We've made education a God in this country. It's an idol that we bow down to, and we put education above serving God. We put education above the church. We put education above the Bible. We put education above our wall with God. You don't, don't act like we don't have an idolatrous country. We're living in the midst of idols, friend. We are the new Athens this morning. You know what blesses my heart, though? Right in the middle of all them idols and right in the middle of all the idols like we got in our country, somebody's going to be just a prayer away from God. Watch what your Bible said, the last verse. Look at the last verse of chapter 17. The last verse of chapter 17 said this, How be it? Certain men clave unto him and (laughs) believed. Among the which, watch this guy's name, don't miss this. Among the which was Dionysus, the Areopagite. Dionysus. Do you know what that word means? I looked it up. The word Dionysus, Brother Michael, means one devoted to Bacchus. I didn't know what that was either. So I had to do some study on what Brother Mikey, who Bacchus was. If this guy means his name is somebody devoted to Bacchus, it was Bacchus. And it doesn't take long to do just a cursory search to find this out, Brother Zeke, that Bacchus was one of their gods. This man's name literally says, I am devoted to this God. And Bacchus was the god of wine, fertility, and vegetation. And they worshipped him in their drunkenness. They worshipped him in their sensuality. They worshipped him in what their hands could produce in the garden. And this man, the Bible said that Paul had to stand in in a place uh, labeled by his name. He was the Areopagite. He stood in that place where he stood up and preached that. It's their temple. This man is a devoted worshipper of this idol and of this God. He's neck deep in it, Brother Cliff. What in the world's going to get him out? God's just a prayer away. It don't matter what his name was. Brother Matthew talking about them names. It don't matter what his name was. It don't matter what he was attached to this morning. I'm glad when he called on the Lord Jesus. You say, what happened to this guy? What happened to this guy was he heard that little old preacher preaching about somebody who died for sinners and rose again three days later. And God did something in his heart. And he said, I don't care what they think about me. I don't care what they say about me. I'm getting out of that false temple. I'm getting away from them idols. I'm trusting in Jesus. And this morning, if you're living your life in an idolatrous shape, worshiping the things of this world, worshiping your little G-gods, 
and chasing money and chasing education and chasing entertainment and chasing fortune and fun and fame this morning you can throw it to the side call on God and he'll be just a prayer away this morning he's just a prayer away from those who are idolaters if you're wrapped in the chains of idolatry wrapped in the chains of materialism and worshiping your own stuff he's just a prayer away He's not just a prayer away for the idolaters. He was a prayer away for the ignorant. Watch what Paul says to these people. This is really, this is really not nice to say what Paul says to them. But it's Bible preaching. Paul starts his message off like this. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens... I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Well, that's not very nice. Paul, you're not talking about other people's religion. I mean, you got yours and I got mine, and you're not to say stuff like that about people's religion. Verse 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. Watch their ignorance. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship you don't even know who he is but I'm going to tell you about him him declare I unto you worshiping a God they don't even know they're ignorant of God and they think that God is ignorant of them some of y'all in here this morning you don't know who God is and you think God don't know who you are You know, I found out that people can get to a place where they feel like God is just some unknown God. I find even with Christians sometimes, can I talk to the saved people in here for just a minute? This ain't just the lost people this morning, it's also saved people. I find sometimes I think Christians even think God just don't know where I'm at. There's some things you won't even talk to him about that's going on in your life because you just feel like God don't care or God don't know and what would God do about it? You think there are certain situations of your life that are indigenous just to you and you are worshiping an unknown God. He doesn't know. Can I clarify to you that this God is not unknown to your trouble this morning? You say, God doesn't know what it's like for someone who said they would stay with you to the end and stood at an altar and committed to love you forever. God doesn't know what that's like for them to betray you and wound you. Why should I talk to him about it? He doesn't know what that's like. He doesn't. The Bible said in Jeremiah chapter 3 and Isaiah chapter number 50 that Israel had become a whorish wife to God. And it broke God's heart to the point where it said that he wrote her a bill of divorcement and put her away. You walk in this morning and think God doesn't know what it's like to be betrayed by someone who claimed to love you. I'm telling you there's a God. He knows exactly what it's like to love someone and be good to someone and then violate that trust. Won't you just go give it to him? He's just a prayer away. You walked up in here carrying this big old load and think there ain't nobody that can help me with this big old load. He does. And he's just a prayer away. You walked in here thinking, God doesn't understand about my disobedient children. I've got these disobedient children, and God doesn't know what that's like. Oh, that's not true. God's got disobedient children all over the place. As a matter of fact, I've been a disobedient child a time or two myself. The Bible even said over there in the Old Testament that Israel was like a disobedient child. God knows what it's like to beget people according to the faith, and then them walk their own way, Brother Roger, and be disobedient. God knows what that's like. You sit here this morning, you got a disobedient child, child that's breaking your heart, child that's doing everything against what you want him to do. You lay there and cry hot tears, and you think God doesn't know. Yes, he does, and he's just a prayer away. And you can bring that child's name to God, and God understands because God's been there. God doesn't understand what I'm going through when I have a loss in my family and there's a death in my family. God doesn't understand that. He doesn't. 
Why God himself, Brother Keith Haynes, looked down from heaven and watched as his only begotten son suffered, bled, and died uh, and sucked his life's breath and laid in the tomb for three days. You think God doesn't understand what it's like to lose a loved one? Sure he does. Uh, And he's just a prayer away this morning. God doesn't understand what it's like for me to be lonely and sit here and be forsaken, feel like people have walked out on me. Oh, yeah, he does. He stood in Gethsemane's garden, and those who said they would stay with him to death, the Bible said they all forsook him and fled. This morning, you might have walked in ignorant of who God is, but he is just a prayer away for you. We used to sing the old song uh, when I was coming up, an uh, old hymn that said, Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Why don't you tell it to Jesus? Tell it to Jesus He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Don't walk out here ignorant that God knows exactly where you're at and exactly what you're going through. And if you choose to carry that by yourself, that's your fault. You don't have to. He's just a prayer away. Let me give you my last point and I'm done. He's just a prayer away for the idolatrous. He's just a prayer away for the ignorant. Lastly, he's just a prayer away for the incriminated. For those who are incriminated. Watch how Paul puts the... Man, Paul, Paul just incriminates the whole crowd. They're just running through life footloose and fancy free, and they think they ain't got a care in the world. And then all of a sudden this preacher comes along and just absolutely puts a dark cloud over their life. You remember the day when you was walking along in life and you thought you was doing pretty good? And no problem. You thought everything's all right. And then all of a sudden you heard some preaching or somebody told you about Jesus, witnessed to you, gave you track, whatever. And then all of a sudden your seemingly happy life that didn't have no problems, all of a sudden now this condemnation set in over your head like a dark cloud. That's what Paul does to this crowd. You say, we ought not to do that to people. Absolutely, we ought to do that to people. You don't know you even need God until you see yourself as an incriminated sinner standing unrighteous and filthy before the God of heaven this morning. Watch what Paul says to this crowd in verse number 30. Watch him incriminate this crowd, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I'd say that would include an American living in the United States in 2023. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day. You have a court date, sir. You have a court date, ma'am. You say, I ain't got a court date, nothing. Yes, you do. The God of heaven has already put out the summons, and you will appear. We must all appear before the judgment seat. Everybody is going to show up one day. Either the Christians at the judgment seat of Christ or the lost at the great white throne judgment. But everybody's got an appointment that they're going to keep. It is appointed. It is appointed. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after this, after this, after this, the judgment. Everybody talking about the afterlife. You better be worried about the afterlife. You better be worried about the after death. You're going to die one day and you're going to stand before God. Watch what he said. He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And it ain't going to be the preacher judging you. You know, everybody, you know, everybody hates all these narrow-minded preachers and always judging me and all these Christians trying to judge me. Oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. We're not going to be the ones judging you. Bunch of idiots getting these tattoos and putting stickers on their cars and saying things like this. He's so dumb. Saying things like this. Only Jesus can judge me. Don't worry about that. He will. Don't you you worry about that, sir. Go ahead. Yuck it up and think, oh, it's going to be a breeze. Only Jesus. Yeah, he will. He will. I 
eyes like a flame of fire, hair like wool, feet like a polished in fire and fire and brass, name on his thigh, king of kings, lord of lords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I promise you this, you'd ten times rather get judged by any self-righteous Christian than you would the God of this universe. I mean, really, how do you think you're going to measure up to the perfect man? I ain't even trying to measure up. I got God's righteousness, friend. Anyways, he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Who is the man God hath ordained? Sister, I'm sorry to tell you, you are not the woman that God ordained. Brother, I know, I know us preachers sometimes, we like to think I'm the man God has ordained to judge everyone. I'm not. I'm just going to preach the Bible to you. <laughs> it ain't me. <laughs> it ain't you. God's ordained a man, though, that's going to judge the world. Who is it? He tells us. Watch the next part. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. How did God signify that all men were incriminated and that his son was going to judge them one day? He let him die on a cross, but then he raised him from the grave three days later. You say, I ain't incriminated. I don't know who you're talking to. I ain't no jailbird. And maybe I was one time, but I've reformed and I've straightened up and I ain't that no more. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you turn your nose up at the idea that I've called you a criminal. And you say, I'm an upstanding citizen in the community. I'm a member of the JCs and I'm a member of, you know, of the Chamber of Commerce. And I do good deeds and I try and help people. And I give money to the Sheriff's Association. And I try and help St. Joseph's. And I give money to the Shriners. And I try and tithe to the church. I'm a good person. I'm not incriminated. I'll tell you what the Bible said. Matter of fact, let me tell you. Can I tell you what the man that God ordained to judge you said? The man God ordained to judge you, this is what he said. John 3, 16, 17, 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all shout on that and that's where we want to stop at. <laughs> Brother Randall Beaver, even sinners know that verse and they'll quote it to the hill. But they don't ever want to go to the next part. Whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. That's where I'm at. <laughs> that's me. That's, that's where I'm at. He that believeth on him is not condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's me. As an 18 year old boy, I got on that side of the verse. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Check it out though. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Sorry, I lied to you. Let me give you verse 19 too. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. Yeah. But men love darkness rather than light. Yeah. For the deeds were evil. Yeah. Sorry, let me give you verse 20 as well because this is good. Yeah. Neither cometh to the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved that he's in the dark. Hey, 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 hey. I'm saying this morning there's a God that's already set a court date for you. And you are incriminated right where you said if you've not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God, Brother Carl, there was a day I realized I was a criminal. I, wa I wasn't wearing an orange jumpsuit. I wasn't wearing prison stripes. But Brother Danny, I realized I was a criminal because I'd committed capital offense. My sins killed God's only son and put him on a cross. And when I realized I was a criminal, I fled for refuge to the one that could save me. And I fell on an altar. And you know what I found? This is what I found. I found he was just a prayer away. He was just a prayer away. I didn't have to do penance. I didn't have to pay money. I didn't have to pray the rosary. I didn't have to hail Mary full of grace. I made one little prayer from one little redneck sinner, and God saved me. And this morning, and this morning, if you could realize, if this morning, if you could realize you're incriminated, you could come to him. You say, I don't even know what to say. I don't either. 
So ain't you got something written out? And I ain't got nothing written out. I got this. this. This works pretty good. This works pretty good, Brother Kent. Here's what works. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. <laughs> and saved him out of all his troubles. <laughs> I got this much down that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart God raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved this morning it's just a prayer away for the incriminated Esther help me over here I'm done the 1970s New York City it's dangerous to live in cities it's dangerous to live anywhere especially in cities Brother Xander, in the 1970s, there was a fellow that got on the loose in New York City that terrorized that place for about two years. He would walk up to park cars in the 70s with a 44 Magnum pistol. Y'all, I ain't talking about no 22. That's, that, that could kill you too. I ain't talking about no 9 millimeter, no 45 ACP. I'm talking about a 44 Magnum. You ever seen what a 44 Magnum can do? He would walk up to park cars his targets mainly were young women. Dark-headed young women was his target. He'd walk up to these parked cars. This is just true stuff. You can look it up. He'd walk up to these parked cars. Brother Jeff, he'd pull out that 44 Magnum. He'd just go shooting in the car. Just murdering people. And in those two years, he killed six people in cold-blooded murder, <laughs> wounding several others. Some even were paralyzed from where the bullets hit him and never walk again. He started writing letters and, and leaving them behind because for whatever reason, serial killers, I think it's the devils in them. If you ever read about devils in the Bible, not, not some book, the Bible is your textbook for devils and demons and possession. Not goofy spirit caster outers and Greg Locke wannabes, not, not goofy nuts like that. What does the Bible say about it? What the Bible says about it, Brother Eddie, is every time a devil shows up, they can't help but make their self known. And I think the reason why all these serial killers always get called is that devil inside of them, they, it, I, I got to tell somebody. Just like the Holy Spirit gets in people, and you got to tell somebody, you get an unholy spirit in you, you want to tell somebody. This fellow started writing notes and putting them out there, Brother Hunter, and he called himself the son of Sam. Sam was a dog that the neighbors had next door, and this fella claimed that he started hearing that dog talk to him, telling him to commit these atrocities and these murders. Sam, this guy, his name was uh, uh, Berkowitz. And Berkowitz, this fella, he grew up like a normal life, but the older he got, he started reading Anton LaVey's The Satanic Bible, started getting involved in the occult, which turned into a life of violence and killing these people. They finally caught Berkowitz and tried him, convicted him, give him six life sentences for all the people he killed. He's come up for parole now several times. He's still alive. He's come up for parole several times and they ain't letting him out. This is the testimony of the son of Sam. This true story, you can read about it in one of Bill Grady's books that's been here to the church before. They said Brother Paul one day from his own lips, his own testimony, he was walking around the yard on a cold day when he had yard time for free and a fellow inmate named Rick walked up to him and handed him a King James Bible. And he said, I'll tell you something, sir. Jesus died for you and Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Now, let me pause right here and say this. I can already sense the self-righteousness welling up in this building. I can already sense some of y'all sitting here like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Can I tell you, most of your New Testament is written by a guy who killed a whole lot more people in cold blood than Berkowitz ever did. Saul walked up into houses and dragged families out and murdered mamas and daddies and babies. Yeah, yeah. So this ain't nothing unusual what God can do. And he said, Brother Chad, he said, I mocked that man. And the reason I mocked him was this, Brother John Collins. He said, I mocked him because I felt like God would never forgive me for what I'd done. 
He said, I mocked him because of how wicked I'd been and how filthy I'd been, how ungodly I was and what I had done to people. I thought God could never forgive me. He got back in that jail cell and he said, every night I'd start reading that Bible. He said, I start reading that Bible. God started working on my old cold heart. You can read his testimony. It's awesome. He said, one night I come across Psalm 34, 6. And David said, this poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. He said, God broke me down like a shotgun. He said, and I fell down my, by my bed. And I called out on God and asked him if he would and if he could to please save an old filthy, rotten sinner like David Berkowitz. He said, and I would have never guessed it, but God saved my soul. That fellow has now been saved for years. You know what he's doing in prison? He's leading Bible studies, preaching to prisoners. And telling folk about the, I'm talking about like the real deal, not like some charismatic kooky stuff. I mean, he's got like serious born again religion. You say, God, I'm such an incriminated sinner and I've done so much job, God couldn't hear me. But old Berkowitz, the son of Sam, got down by his bed one night. You know what he found out? Somebody as far out and as low down as he was. God was just a prayer away. <laughs> he be not far from every one of us. He didn't specify that he's only near the white man or the black man or the yellow man or the red. No, 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 no. I don't care where you at or what you've done or where you come from. He ain't that far away this morning. Maybe your heart's broken. Maybe you don't know which way to turn. He's just a prayer away call on him bring it to him and if you're lost and think God would not save such a wicked incriminated sinner like me won't you come try him and see won't you come taste and see that the Lord is good let's all stand this morning he's just a prayer away father I thank you for the day that I called on you by faith and found you to be just a prayer away I thank you for the times, so many times in my life when I had nowhere to go and nowhere to turn and nobody could help me or answer for the things I needed and I brought them to you and you was just a prayer away. Lord, I pray you'd help your people this morning. Somebody lost this morning, may they come call on you. In Jesus' name, amen. He's just a prayer away.